I'm going to talk about RACU, previously known as PER6, until October last year. Long story short, it's a different language. So, I mean, you, you think about uh, something that has a six uh, in its name, and then you say, okay, so it's like five, or little, you know, bigger or better, or whatever. But it's not, it's totally different. Still, there is more than one way to do it. So, Larry Wall, uh, which by the way, his nickname is, is Tim Toady. There is more than one way to do it. So, the basic idea about uh, uh, Raku is that there is more than one way to do it. But before, let me tell you about Raku. Before that, what are the kind of things that many cool emerging languages do nowadays? Uh, what, what kind of things are, are you going to find in, in new languages and also old languages and, uh, which are getting new features? One of them is Unicode, because Unicode is important. It's very extremely important. I mean, it's, it's the basis of every single language, it's the basic of every single text computing nowadays. Let's check out, for instance, JavaScript. JavaScript has very good support of Unicode. I don't know if you can see that. Let me, let me. Okay, load it up for you. Still. You see that th th there are many ways of supporting JavaScript in, in, I mean, of supporting Unicode in JavaScript. For instance, you can write the name of, of uh, identifiers, you can write them in, in Unicode, but also you can use them inside regular expressions. So you can check if something uh, is, is actually uh, Greek or not, and you can, you can then call this uh, function with this thing, and then it, it will actually output yes because it's... Uh, but still you see something here, which is this thing, right? This is you. So you are telling explicitly JavaScript that it's uh, it's Unicode. It's a Unicode regular expression. It's like it happened, for instance, in Python 2. In Python 2, if you wanted a Unicode string, you have to put uh, a new in front. So, I mean, it's, it's supported. And you will see this in, in many languages. Uh, many languages will have different kind of support. But there are some other things. For instance, lambdas. Lambdas are so important that even C++ has lambdas now, which is totally amazing. Also, immutability. Immutability is... Uh, the two things are, are kind of related because uh, uh, they are related to functional programming. Lambdas are functions that you can use as data and, and they are first class citizens. And immutability is something that you are going to use because you are going to get some kind of variables that are not changed and you are going to do some kind of things with them. Like for instance this. Uh, I will. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, right. This is closure. It's not a very modern language, but it's very similar to, to many uh, other uh, Lisp-like languages, like, like, for instance, Guile or some other like that. The first thing is we define a lambda here. This is a lambda because what we are saying, we, said we are defining some, some general kind of uh, uh, data, which is ellipses, and then we are saying, okay, so this is going to be an fn, a lambda, and then it's going to take this as an argument and it's going to do this, right? And then this function is a... Is a uh, uh, rec uh, recursive function, which is using that lambda right here, right? So I'm using both things here at the same time. The, the good thing about uh, immutability is that uh, you can be pretty sure that the, some particular data structure is not going to change, and that allows for loss optimization. So also needs you changing a little bit the way you, you think about, uh, about uh, algorithms and everything, and it allows you to forget about loops, so that loops can be eventually deprecated. There are also some other kind of things like postmodern assignment. Basically what you do is you destructure arguments. So instead of taking one data structure here and then you do some kind of exploration of that data structure and you put several data structure on the other side, on the left hand side, you can do that in one single way. And also gradual typing. Gradual typing is a very cool thing that many, many modern languages have. And it allows you to use type if you want not use it if you don't want, right? You can have some, some types, uh, I mean, some, some data structures that are whatever, they, they, they can change, uh, they can have different types uh, along its uh, uh, lifetime, but then some others you say, no, no, I want this data structure to be like that. I'm putting these two things together in Kotlin with the reader, who is the father of postmodernism, and then he was all the time talking about the structuring and Okay, that's it. You see several things here. First one is a lambda. 
lambda is right here. Lambdas are all over the place. There is almost no single language that doesn't have lambda. I'm pretty sure that Fortran in the next iteration will have lambdas. Anyway, just in like here, right? And then you also, uh, Kotlin is very nice because it allows to the structure in a pretty simple way. You just create a data structure in any way, like a struct or whatever, and you can assign it to something else. With You don't even need to, to, uh, to specify what you are going to assign to the first thing, what you are going to, uh, to assign to the second thing. You see that in this case, I return a result, which is a data structure that I define right here, and then result says 42 and true. In this case, says something else and false. So it's a data structure, this data structure right here, with two things. Here, I'm assigning the result of that, which is a data structure, to do two different variables. I'm destructuring that data structure directly, which is easy, which is nice. I don't have to create an intermediate data structure. I don't have to deal with, with issues of, of memory uh, allocation and things like that. Pretty fast, pretty straightforward, type safe, everything very nice, right? Then you have things like pattern matching for complex decision making. So uh, uh, the kind of thing it avoids is if cascades. So you don't have like, if this happens, then do that. If else, if this other thing happens, then another thing, then another if, then another else. You know, if cascades. By the way, this is a very nice cascade in Iceland. All the pictures are mine. Uh, and they are all Creative Commons, so you can download them. You can do whatever you want to do. It's the Creative Commons CC by SA. Anyway, so we are going to try them in Scala. Scala is, I'm not going to say a pretty nice language. I'm going to say it's an academic language. It means that it does some things very well, some other things not so well. That also means that as any other academic language, it was in obscurity for a long time. And then all of a sudden, data science happened. And then everybody said, oh, data science, we're going to learn Scala. But anyway, it's a, it's a language that uh, you can do very nice things with Spark and everything. But uh, it's also object-oriented, it's functional, and it's got very nice features. Anyway, I was looking at, at, uh, at this pattern matching, which we use this thing called match. It's a, it's a keyword in Scala, which is match. And then you check card, and you can check it against A's. 3, J, Q, you can do m more complicated things here. Like you can put uh, some regular expression, uh, you can compare it with a type, you, you can do uh, some other complicated things. And you also have a default type, uh, a default uh, uh, case, which is this one, I mean, which, which you, are, you are going to use. In this case, it's like a, a ca cascade of if, only it's nicer, because you see very clearly the intent of the code that you are seeing there. Eventually you use it, you know, using you call it in points and it goes to here and it prints whatever, right. Multiple dispatch. The great thing about multiple dispatch is that depending on the signature of a method or function, you're going to call different code. So again, you avoid ifs. Again, you say, you state very clearly what's the intent of your code. And then your GIT compiler or anything that's a, low, a lower level can see very clearly what's going on. And then you, it can kind of optimize what's, what's going to happen. Of course, if it's functional, it's going to be even, even better because you can cache, you can do memoize, any kind of thing. We're going to do it with Julia. Julia is also a language that was created for science, which means that it doesn't have things like, you know, web or database, things like that. It's science, you know. We do science, nothing else. Of course, there is something like that because it's a general purpose language. It was very, very recently uh, turned into, into uh, version 1.0, which broke everything, of course. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a language that has got very extensive support of macros. And it's, I mean, there, there are many cool things about Julia. But in this case, we are, we are using this multiple dispatch with these two functions, two different functions. We are going to use the Spanish way of expressing cards, like bastos, espadas. Uh, anyone knows this? It's, you know, it's, it's actually not Spanish, it's from Naples. But anyway, so we use two different enums, this, this, uh, uh, Ampersand over here is a macro, so the way Julia defines macros is, is by uh, uh, using an ampersand, and the way, the way Julia defines an enum is by using a macro, which is kind of nice. Anyway, it's kind of a type, so if I am calling to string with something that is a symbol of the, of the uh, American or, or French uh, kind of uh, uh, card deck, it's going to call the first one and then it's going to call the, the other one. 
This is also a lambda. So we are defined to string as a lambda because we are not putting you know, the, the key or so whatever. We are saying, no, no, this thing is going to be equal to that. And also we are using Unicode. We can use in, inum, we can use directly Unicode symbols here as Unicode. That's cool, right? Sloths will inherit the earth. Actually, I'm too lazy, so I was looking up for a, for a picture of a sloth. I didn't find it. I found this picture of, of penguins, and penguins are cool. They are plush penguins. So, anyway, lazy evaluation is very powerful. It allows you to define to work with infinite data structures. You, you can have anything in it. You, you, only when, when you're actually needing something, when you're actually printing something, it comes to life. But uh, uh, working with lazy is, is also functional because you can work with mathematical data structure, infinite sequences, uh, infinite maps, whatever. And also, there's this, this thing called cascading. Cascading is something that allows you to kind of put the result into a computation, into another uh, uh, computation, and then into another computation without the need to use uh, intermediate variable or anything. You just say, okay, I want the result of this to be processed by this, the result of this is going to be processed by this other thing, and so on and so forth. Let's look at it in F sharp. F sharp was a language that was created by Microsoft, which is why nobody paid attention to it for a long time. Uh, but then it's a cool language. It's a, it's a purely functional language. It's a language that's working on the on the uh, on the .NET virtual machine. Uh, yes, please. Do you see it? Five minutes. Okay. Yeah. I'm almost done. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, compute something which is called the Horadam uh, sequence. Horadam sequence is kind of a generalized Fibonacci sequence. Everyone is using Fibonacci sequence, so I'm going to do something different. Uh, but you see what, what we are doing is this is the first element of the sequence, so this is the first thing that, that's going to go into the, into the pipeline. Then we pipe it into this thing. So what we are telling it is you are going to pick this up and you are going to create an infinite sequence out of that. And then eventually what you are going to do is you are going to append it to the first two elements. So I'm going to put that in the beginning, right? And then this is totally lazy. So uh, I'm telling it, I want this, this infinite sequence. And I'm going to have a, a, a lazy data structure that's going to hold that. And then I'm going to compute it and I, I'm also going to use uh, this pipe to just take the first 15 so that eventually when I compute the first 15, they come to life, right? That's cool and that's uh, actually very fast. I, I got all of them in, my, in my, my computer, actually. Finally, inheriting is much better than composing. I can't reduce it anymore. So you can use traits, mixing and rows. Uh, the 90s were a, a little bit all about uh, object-oriented programming, but then something more complicated came. Uh, people were talking about meta, meta uh, object protocols so that you can create all kinds of things. Anyway, my point is that you can create a new kind of ob objects or classes by composing other objects. Like, for instance, using it in, in Rust. Rust is a very nice language. It's supposed to be safe because uh, people were tired of using C and getting shot in the feet. And so they say, okay, yeah, we are going to do something totally different. And, and then they, they talk about Rust. Rust has a very, very uh, interesting concept of data properties so that some, only some things can work with, with some other things. But here what you define is a struct, which is just a struct. It's a data structure. And then you define a trait. And then here what you say, okay, so what I am going to do is I'm going to apply this code for this trait for this data structure. So you kind of bind it together. And that's, you know, using traits in, in Rust. What's the point with Raku? I didn't talk about Raku so far. Well, just a little bit. The, the point with Raku is that it's got everything and the kitchen sink. This is actually my kitchen sink at home. <laughs> right? It's, it's a little bit dirty. There's some chopstick here. And the rest of the... Anyway, it took me a while. to. Uh, in, in most cases, I, I hadn't seen those, those uh, uh, languages ever. I, I had never written a line of code in, in Rust or or in, uh, of course in F sharp or JavaScript a little bit, Python also. It took me a while, uh, but not too much. Uh, the most difficult part was actually uh, Kotlin uh, because syntax is tricky. Because you have to know how to do some specific thing like concatenating two strings or, or getting an element of an array. 
and that's a new Emacs mode for everyone. So it took a while. <laughs> you had to look up the right Emacs mode. But I understood the concepts. The concepts were there because I code in Raku. So every one of those things is in Raku and many more. This is me, Jim Merello. I'm part of the kind of the core of Raku development. I, I work more or less with the, with the documentation. And that's my, my GitHub, by the way. And this is this is going to suck anyway, so I'm not going to even try. It's on the web, <laughs> you can check it out. But this is a Raku program which has around 20 lines of code, which implements every single concept I have talked about here. Every single one of them. Plus one that is incredibly cool. I will see if I I can show it here. You see it here? You know the WhatsApp? It's Arab number. Raku is able to do arithmetic with Arab literals. As far as I know, there is no language that's able to do that. This, this is actually a range. So it's a range that, that goes from 1 to 1,000, right? So this is one. To, and it's also written in the right direction because Unicode is important. So if you are written in Arab, you have to do it in the right direction. You type it in the direction, but it shows up in that direction. So it's incredible. I mean, you, uh, this is not part of the highlight. I'm using this slanted eye, which is an Unicode thing. Anyway, it's, it's there. You can check it out. So learn Raku to learn every single language. <laughs> well, at least the cool ones. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I, uh, repeat the question. Yeah, please. Uh, how do you cope if you're in a team, like, oh, uh, sorry, let's say an international team, and other people don't, can't type Arab keys and they have to maintain your code? I mean, it's, it's no big deal. Uh, I, I repeat the question. So, uh, he's asking uh, uh, how people is able to, to maintain a team where people type in, di in different different uh, ways. Is that correct? Is that... My people, I don't, I don't know how to type Arabic characters. <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, you use Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> Control X8 tab, and then you get all the Unicode uh, things, and then you say, "I want this one." And that's it. Or you look it up in the in the web, and then copy and paste. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, please. Um, yesterday, I heard that, the, that there's a way to uh, interact with uh, libraries from other languages, like Python. That's correct. Could you a little bit elaborate on that? How it's yeah, the thing is that uh, Raku has got something which is called native call, right? So native call basically uh, it allows you to to embed uh, things which are written in any other language using shared libraries. So you just say, oh, so I want this function, which is taken from that particular shared library, and you can do that with Python. You can embed the interpreter of Python. There is something called inline Python. There is also inline pair, so you can you can interpret pair, and you can basically do anything. Many, many libraries are, are just basically. Uh, I want this this C library or even anything that can be compiled from from Go or Rust or whatever uh, to a, to a shared library. I want this inside inside Raku. So I load it, and then what I do is I want this function in C to be called that other way, and this data ch structure, which is uh, in the original language, to be called in this other way. It's called native calling. It's it's amazing. It works pretty well. Thank you very much. Thank you.